Amen. If you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Amen. I'm still feasting, contemplating, and enjoying the message we heard Sunday morning. Hallelujah. It's amazing how many people in the last couple of days that have made mention of it. Praise God. Say amen if you're there. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. You know, if, if you're not willing to get rid of the things you don't, the weights, it's really doubtful you're going to be getting rid of the sin. See, 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 people have relegated sin to them ugly, nasty, gross ones, obvious ones. That, that, man, you can walk in here a plum fool and re figure, re figure it out that ah, I ought not to be doing those things. But those aren't the ones that trip people up. It's the sin, the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life that get the best people sidelined. And the sin which so easily beset us. It's personal. What I got to overcome might not be what you have to overcome. And what you have to overcome might not be what I've got to overcome. So you've got to work out your salvation. You've got to go, wait a minute, I, I can't do that. I can't go. You may be okay with it. I can't. Because you personally know where you want to go and what you want to do for God. Are you with me? And let us run. Understand, all that is so that we can run the race that with patience, the race that is set before us. God has set before each and every one of us an opportunity. Will you complete that opportunity? Will you finish your purpose and your calling? Isaiah 6 and verse 8. And there'll be one more verse after that. Appreciate you standing. Trust me, if you stand with me for a few minutes, I'll stay standing the rest of the time and let you be seated. What a deal. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am. No, here am I. Send me. Now, just because I want to throw a monkey wrench into the thing, get you thinking. If I said right now someone had some, someone vomited in the bathroom and I said I need a volunteer. That's so funny, there are always those Christians willing to raise their hand. But notice that millisecond when you thought about it, I don't want to do that. You're, you're going to find, honestly find, that the things that make a difference are often the things you don't want to do. And that's what separates the great from the could have been great. Are you with me? Luke 18 and verse 8, and then we'll pray and you can relax if you have a good attitude. I'm just going to read part B of this because I want to make a point here. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. So we know the season and the time that we're talking about in the last days. Will he find faith? And if you paid attention, I read Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. How many knows what precedes Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1? Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> the faith chapter. With the help of the Lord and you and your faith. I want to, I didn't know if I wanted to call this the Hall of Faith, or we still need heroes. The world's full of zeros. 
that are going to go with the flow. Dead fish go with the flow. I'm going to leave it up to the media, God, what we title this. Jesus, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, I got some words written down on this paper, but they're dead without you. I got something burning in my heart and something I feel you placed there. God, help me, Lord, to whoever's listening, to whoever here will hear these words and hopefully somehow, some way, they will come alive and stir something in someone that they will decide they just don't want to meander through life, but they want to make a difference. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I am thankful for the stories of faith. In fact, I heard something really, really negative this week that stirred my faith. I'll be careful and I won't use any of the preacher's names. But a couple of our preachers, well-known, were at a very high-end restaurant back east and they were dining and eating and they were list they overheard the conversation at the table next to them and they looked and there were a couple of very well-known politicians sitting there and they turned and looked and one of those politicians looked and said oh no we know who you are you're the united pentecostal church and we're coming for you It was Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Listen, don't get upset. I want to be in something that matters. I'm not trying to fight the air. I'm not trying to fight the battle of making ends meet. I'm not running the rat race. I'm not trying to see who dies with the most toys toys because you win jack all. I want to I wanna be a part of the race that's set before us. Amen. I'm thankful for the stories of faith and lives lived by faith, but will there be people of faith today? Not people to just say they, but people literally, because can you imagine it's you that sees the need? Seize the Lord. Will it be you that steps up to say, here am I. Send me. Because it will not be into a comfort zone. It will be into a crisis conflict zone. Right? It happened in a valley far, far away for 40 days and nights giant had sown fear into the heart of every soldier and weaved a stronghold of doubt in the heart of a king. And after 40 days, fate, the will of God, sent a shepherd boy who had previously been anointed into the valley of stagnation. It's literally called the valley of Pastamine, which means a twisting and a turning. And a looking which way you're going to go, which side you're going to choose. That moment when I talked about cleaning the bathrooms, I, I know I should jump. But if I can get up out of it and somebody else do it. I've done a few foolhardy things in my time stepped up to preach a, in a town nobody wanted to preach in, and take a church nobody wanted to take, and do a few things that were considered foolhardy by faith. It was David, while everyone was cowering in fear, while the giant had stagnated and stalled all those that should have stepped up, when God was looking for a hero, it was David that said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? But what is a hero? You see, I, I think if we, most of us, we, think, we may have a picture of ourselves. You may think you're a hero. And 
You may think that you've done the things that, well, good for you. But the dictionary says a hero is a person noted for courageous acts or nobility of character, a person who, in the opinion of others, has special achievements, abilities, or personal qualities and is regarded as a role model or ideal. There's always a need. Hebrews 11, and I contemplated reading the entire chapter, but that wouldn't leave me left to work with for the message. So I'll take it in faith that if you don't know, you'll go read it. And if you have, you'll be able to follow along today. But Hebrews chapter 11 spans many generations, many times. Different causes, different places, different things. The, the great question is, will you stand up today? You see, in 1 Samuel 17, the Bible says, And the men of Israel said, You see, David shows up. Have you seen this man that has come up? Look. It's formidable. It's foreboding. It's a big task. Surely to defy, defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be the man who killeth him, the king, shall enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So, even after all those temptations of what you get out of it, Saul had no takers. Worldly-minded people will seldom take on world-sized tasks. In 1 Samuel 17, it says, Now the Philistines gathered together armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko which belonged to Judah. Now, I preached this probably about a year ago about this little subject. So it's not my point tonight, but I want to, I want to point that again. Remember, it already belonged to Judah, but the Philistines had gathered there. The Philistines will take the territory, you let them. They will claim it, they'll stand on it, and if you're not willing to fight for it, they'll keep it. That's not just territory of lands around you, but it might be part of your heart, part of your mind a part of your thinking, a part of your opinion, a part of the makeup of who you are and what makes you you. And pitched between Shoko and Ezekiah in apostamine. That's that twisting and turning. And saw the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched in the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. They set the battle in array. Shoko already belonged to Judah. Yet when David showed up, he found men. Everybody say, men. They were dressed for battle. They were built for war. But they refused to engage in the fight. We got a lot that looked the part, that speak the part. But when it comes to face the battle, they fall apart. We have to ask, are we just getting dressed and talking the right things, but never actually stepping up to do the right things? Because really, if you're walking in faith, you just can't sit by and watch. You can't. In fact, the Bible talks about if you see someone with a need and you have the answer to need, don't let them go. you got to check yourself. God, you see, God sees all that stuff. You're not going to get away and judge, well, they gave this thing. Oh, you got your own walk. I've got to give what I've got. you got to give what you've got. But sadly, it seems today's Christianity has produced folks that would rather live for the accolades of humanity rather than the applause of heaven. In fact, Jesus said it this way, the people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I don't want to be just a lip service saint. The last thing I want to do is come back from a melee with straight clothes, an unmarked face, and clean knuckles. You know, there's not a woman in the house that would be like, man, that battle's strong. My, my, my husband got his legs in. There's always that guy with celebrating with the team that's bloodied and got grass stains, and he's got a clean jersey on. Yeah, he may hold the trophy, but he'll never know the victory. 
Ephesians 5 talks about, it says, See then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. If you're not fighting evil, you just might be assisting it. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Because the clock is ticking. Even for young Nehemiah, for young Aaron here today, for Elise or Faith or any of our teenagers. We each have a limited time. We each only have a limited number of days. And what would you do if you knew that your time was about to be up? What would you want your life story to say? Because it is personal, but it is somewhat public. Sometimes our lives are guarded. Sometimes it's shared. Everyone has one. Real people have real stories. The question is, are you telling yours? Like I spoke about last week, I'm sure that Ruth, after all that she encountered and how things played out as she stepped back and marveled, that I'm pretty sure Naomi became somewhat of a hero to her. The writer of Hebrews takes time to talk about and point out the heroes of faith. The, the Bible readers uh, uh, tonight will know that the entire chapter is given to recognizing and celebrating heroes of faith. Otherworldly people like Abraham, Samson, Gideon, and more. And no, they had no director of CG or computer graphics. There were no Marvel superpowers that were done on a green screen. They had to have faith. They had to step up where the rubber meets the road or the sandal meets the dirt and show up for the fight. David couldn't say, well, this is a good story. I need Steven Spielberg to step in right now to work this battle out for me. No, 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 no. It's not something in the movies. It's something in your life. The problem is the opiate of, of entertainment has caused some of us to become a spectator in our own lives. And we've conceded the fight to become a spectator in the few years that we live. Are you with me? I'm thankful that the writer of Hebrews filled the chapter with men and women that has filled the lessons of Sunday school classes and sanctuary sermons for years. I'm still enamored by them. However, as I read to you in Hebrews 12, the same writer, you see chapters and verses in your Bible were placed there for ease of reading and location so we could find verses. The writer shifts his attention from these icons and he throws the hero challenge at our feet. An entire chapter devoted to amazing people that we can dig up in archaeology and know that they lived and know what happened and see in some of the relics. But when he gets to chapter 12, he throws the gauntlet down after listen name after name and says, what about you? What about you? What will your life mean? Will, will you walk in faith? And he throws out the hero challenge at our feet. The NIV says, it's this say, since we have such a crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back. And especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up and let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. In fact, Paul takes up the mantle, a warrior in his own right, and gave his greatest charge, Timothy, some wise warfare advice. He said, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men 
who shall be able to teach others also. And understand, this is a walk of faith. I don't care the things you pass on. They don't mean a thing in eternity, but your faith does. Mm, let that sink in and marinate just a little bit. Thou therefore under hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Do you see what this means? Paul did and wanted Timothy to war a good fight. You see, there's something about a hero. There's something about people that walk in faith. There's that intangible baton that needs to be passed on to somebody for it to be successful. Now, I believe Paul wanted to make sure that Timothy got a hold of that baton of faith. And I could read the list of the, of the things that Paul endured, but the greatest thing he endured was the fact that he handed off the baton to someone to be his successor. Like all those pioneers who blazed the way and those, those that are cheering us on in the great cloud. It means we better get on with it. It means at some point you have to tell yourself, wait a minute, all these weights and sins and things I've involved myself in, uh, have they kept me from the big show? Have they whittled me right on out of what really matters? Have I busied myself with the trivial while all heaven watches as evil seems to triumph? Can I say, I don't know what time it is on your clock. I don't know where your life clock stands, but I do believe I can truthfully say it's high time to step up. It's high time to start running the race. It's high time to get the mentality of never quitting. There's no, no, time, no, no room for extra spiritual fat or no parasitic sins. Uh, I'm glad that the writer of Hebrews addresses us. He just didn't talk about all those. In Hebrews 11, he brought his point around to what was most important to us today. Will you walk in faith? Will you show up and run the race in faith? What, what are you going to amount to when it's all said and done? What's going to be written said about you? What, what are you going to mean when it's all said and done? What, what, what is the real epitaph? What you want people to say? Well, what's your real epitaph going to read? Uh, you see, see, because if we're not careful, we kind of tend to overlook the everyday heroes because our attention seems to be drawn to the fictional superhero with cool powers, and even cooler costumes. That is why it is so important, because I believe it is essential that each and every one of us stop, take time, take account, and realize that our real story, a real story of faith will be filled with a lot more pain, panic, and pitfalls. And if it wasn't for the everyday hero who stepped in to call us into the, the battle. I've often talked about the day that Brother Monroe reached out to me. I didn't know at the time what it was. I didn't realize that the grand scheme of things, that the simple choice to walk away from the life I was living, the living for God, all of a sudden mattered in eternity. To me, it was just another day, just another choice. Didn't realize the magnitude of what it was. How, how many understand the magnitude of what it is when you choose you this day who you will serve? I wonder if you realize the magnitude of when you decide to walk away and do something more involved in the world than in the kingdom. I wonder if we really realize the magnitude what we give our life to. Now, may, 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 maybe they didn't save the day, but they certainly saved our day. And I'm thankful for the the man that called me onto this journey of faith. Years ago, a song came out, and I apologize if it offends you, but I've never forgotten it. And I, 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 I was kind of raised at a time where, well, I tell you what, I, I was really trying to find myself. I, you know, 
traveling and going overseas and being raised overseas and being outcast and outsider, just looking for a place to fit in, I found that it was hard to fit into my own self. But I'll never forget a song by a lady. And you have to understand, I, her, her, her singing is she's just looking for a good man. <laughs> just looking for a good man. That, hey, hey, ladies, ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, every woman wants to find a knight in shiny armor. The problem is we've got too many fools in tinfoil running around, polished up, looking like they're trying to be somebody. Hello? Where have all the good men gone? And where are all the gods? Where is the streetwise Hercules to fight the rising odds? Is there a white knight upon a fiery steed? Late at night I toss and turn and I dream of what I need. I need a hero. I'm holding out for a hero till the end of the night. He's got to be strong and he's got to be fast and he's got to be fresh from the fight. I need a hero. I'm holding out for a hero till the morning light. He's got to be sure and he's got to be soon and he's got to be larger than life. I'm holding out for a hero. The writer of Hebrews lets us know that heaven is holding out for a hero, someone to cheer on, someone to point at, someone to carry on the lineage and, and take the baton of faith to move forward. And as we go into dark times and crazy up times about people, who's going to be carrying the baton? Well, the writer of Hebrews gives us a few clues so that I can turn this into a, a teaching lesson rather than just an emotional upheaval. Heroes have habits. And I know that we are currently in the running dispensation. we got to run the race set before us, but let us be honest. We all want to be heroes. Come on. You want to be the one that gets up and saves the day. It's okay. It's okay to want to be the hero. Can we go ahead and say that? And I'm not talking prideful or arrogance. I'm talking about someone that when the chips are down, you stand up. First Corinthians admonishes Christians in chapter 9, verse 24, Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the price, so run that you may attain. You realize that? The gauntlet was, was, was accepted. Okay. If you're looking for faithful, let it be me. He just said it. Paul just made the statement. He made it very clear. Run to win. Get in this thing to win this thing. Look for the, the, the opportunity. Be a part of it. You, get yourself ready. You be ready at all times. We're admonished and encouraged. It's okay to want to win. It's okay to want to succeed. It's okay to say, I want my life to matter. And yeah, I'm making decisions and choices that puts me right in the middle of the fight of faith. Yes, I'm sacrificing on purpose. Yes, I'm showing up on purpose. Yes, I'm at prayer on time on purpose. Yes, I'm reading my Bible. Yes, I'm doing Yes, I'm there. You're going to find me there. Why? I want to matter. It's okay to strive to be great in the things of God. It's okay to say, hey, wait a minute. I'm making myself available. Trust me. I get calls every week of why people can't be at church. I, I, I missed four calls in a 15 or 20 minute span because I stepped outside just to work just a little bit. And I come walking in. They called me every couple of seconds, it seemed like. It's always someone with an excuse. I heard one person say, I'd knock on the door if I knew they'd listen to me. Well, gee, that don't take any faith. Well, if I knew God wanted me to give it, I'll give it. And it wouldn't be faith. 
You see, he's looking for faith. You see, the people in Hebrews, the deeds that they did weren't all the big deal. It's the fact they walked in faith. You will not be presented with a Goliath. It's been there, done that. You will not have to stand up like Esther. It's been done. You have got to face the issue in your life with faith. The question is, have you or will you? See, it's walking by faith. It's not, well, bless God, you better believe if a giant walked in here right now with a spear the size, I want, I'm a, you ain't even been down to, you don't even know what it, you haven't held a slingshot in 100 years. That's not a fight you're going to fight. That's not a fight he's going to want you to fight. Because it's going to be your head on the wall. You have to fight your fight of faith. You have to understand the Hebrews 11, all the stuff that they did, that's great, but that's theirs. What's yours? And will you fight the fight of faith? Will you walk the walk of faith? Second Chronicles 69 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf, behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. You see, you have to walk in that mode. You have to walk in that mindset. You have to walk in that. You have to understand that even the Monday, Wednesday night service is important to be there because tonight could be the night. And it's all those times. David was just delivering cheese and bread, but it was his divine moment. Gideon was just treading out into the structure, but that was, you see, it's going to be on an ordinary day with the very thing God wants you to step up to do whatever. He, he, he may never ask you to fight a giant or tread out a threshing floor. He may simply tell, want you to go witness and knock on a door, write a check, do whatever it is that's in your wheelhouse to do. Be faithful, learn to sing. Play an inch, whatever it is, big or small. Because deep down inside of us, we all have desire to be the knight in shining armor, the, the valiant warrior, that unlikely person who shows up and faces down overwhelming odds. It's okay if it's done for God's glory. Like Shama, who stood up and defended that little field, that land, when everybody else ran. It was just another day. But not for Shema. Because that's the day he stood and said, not today, devil. See, I don't know what it's going to look out, look for you. It may be just a day when you walk in the house and say, that's it. This goes on no further. It may be a point when you're in your walk where you decide to run in and clean all the weights and the sin out of your house and declare, like, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to quit this playing church stuff. I'm going to get my schedule right, my life right. We're going to be faithful. We're going to be a family that's known that we are there Dark daylight, sunshine, rain, snow. We are going to be faithful. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you're going to be a giant killer like David and step up when something big gets in the way. They both mattered. They, they both counted. They were both needed. He, the little maid that simply spoke to Naaman, it was her moment. It wasn't huge next to a giant, but it made a difference to Naaman. Or Esther who just simply declared in the face of death, if I perish, I perish. See, it's a mindset. It's an attitude that you live. It's not something that you put on like your Sunday best. It's you. It's who you are. It's I'm just going to live by faith. I'm going to walk by faith. I'm not just going to talk it and try to say it's an appealing moment right now. No, 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 no. I'm not going to walk a day where I don't try to see where I can do something for God. It's just being there day in and day out. And you create a life that belongs in the hall of fame. Deep down, we want to be the catalyst that leads to victory. That's okay. We need some folks willing to take up their cross to fill the gap. Ezekiel tells us in 22 and 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Whose name should have been there? 
whose name should have been that? Should that have been rewritten in a different way? Was it your name that should have been there? Was it my name? Is there a moment now as God looks for people to make a difference? We can talk all the dumb politics we want and worry about them. All they are is proof. There's an opportunity for someone to stand up in the gap. Are you going to sit there and complain about the enemy or are you going to stand up against it? But you don't understand, Pastor. I look at my life and I don't matter. That's when it matters most. Because when the reality hits and our story tends to get the best of us, many times we, well, I'll just go timidly into the night. Eh, forget the whole idea, right? But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull off what Brother Mallory said. What if? What if it is you? What if it's not too late? What if it's right in front of you? What if your gray moment is your next choice? What if today is that day? What, what if right now? What if that, that, what happens in the next few moments in the ticker of your lifetime matters more than, what, 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 what? Oh, well, some of y'all, oh man, what about those people that are saved at the last minute? Well, bless God, they got saved at the last minute. May not like Samson's story, but he's in the hall of faith. Some of us done a, a whole bunch of dumb things. We may not compare him to Samson, but listen, being lost is being lost. I don't care to what degree. Being saved is being saved. I don't care to what degree. You may not want Samson's story, but hey, he's in the hall of faith. I'll take it. So, so there's some people going to be lost for the Delilahs. At least he made it in the end. Uh, you see, see some, some some of y'all too arrogant in your self-righteousness. Lust is bad. Lust is wrong. Not all lust is bad and wrong. Or else none of us would be here. Someone got it. Not all fire is bad. If your house is on fire, that's bad. But if you've got a nice roaring fire, fire during a cold winter day in your fireplace... That's okay. <laughs> this might be too much for some of you. Maybe you're not. Maybe maybe you're not getting it. Money's a great tool, but it's a horrible master. And if you make it anything more than a tool, guess who the master is? It ain't you. It's a pretty good list in Hebrews eleven. Some of those folks started out pretty mediocre, too. Gideon's just some old boy trying to get by. David was just the youngest of a, in a family out there tending to the sheep, cleaning up the muck. And Esther was a little orphan girl. So let me, let, for the sake of our mind's eye, how do you get on the list? How do you get on the list? Anybody want to get on the list? Or am I the only one? Anybody want to get on the list? I want to be on the list. All I, I, you know, wait a minute. I, I can't help it that my journey's brought me to 2022. Started in 67. And it's still going. It's like, it, it's like the writing. Here, heroes, heroes are made by habits. Heroes are produced with purpose. If you go back and examine the list in Hebrews 11, or, or if you think about the everyday heroes around you, they all have habits. You see, I think Jesus may boil it down to the habits of heroes by saying that hero status is really a, a matter of sacrifice. I said the bad word, didn't I? I said the bad word. Naughty, naughty, bad word. Why can't I just be, why can't I be on the list without that? You can't. You can't. Yeah. Even the rich young ruler came to, I've obeyed it all. Give everything you got to the one who gave you it all in the first place. Think about that. 
and he couldn't do it. He believed God gave it to him once, but didn't believe God gave it to him again, and he wouldn't sacrifice. Matthew 7, and therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, this is Jesus speaking, this ain't me, and do with them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. Now we just finished the series where we know the both sides of this story. Are you building on the rock of sacrifice or are you building on the sand of selfishness? Look, many would-be heroes have fallen prey to worldly pursuits. Greater than Many of us here today have probably gone by the wayside because the weights and worldly pursuits have become so appealing because if you don't walk in the spirit, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Jesus was clear on how to at least get your name on the list. Matthew 16, 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. John 15, 13 says, no, great, no greater love has any man than a man that lays down his life for his friend. I wonder if many times we look at that as our colleagues and not our friend. You won't give that up for God, but he's the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You see, I know we think laying down life is dying. But what if we thought about it like this? And I, I know I'm real slow tonight. How are we to lay our life down? How are people that make the list on the Hall of Faith, how are they to lay their life down? They set their desires and dreams aside to make others' dreams a reality. Another way to look at it is this. The heroes of Hebrews and our heroes habitually lay their life down by standing up when others sit down, speaking up when others shut up, walking in when others walk out. They are present when others are absent, seeing and believing the best when others see and believe the worst. You see, heroes habitually do the opposite of what the world does. I see nothing in that for me. I'm going this way. As our music leader and director comes up here and spends time after time working with people to sit just so they do a good job on a Sunday. As preachers just spend time pouring. You, you think we really want to get up here and bomb? Do you think any preacher across the planet, even the bad ones, want to get up and be bad? <laughs> Sarah, we don't. We want you to hear something worthy. My God, Ian, I, I, I mean, you're, you're a friend. Carl, you're a friend. I didn't pour over this today to get up here and bomb out. And sadly, some people, well, you did okay. What? I did okay. Why don't you come out and hang out today with me? Come read and pray and do what I do to get ready. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I'll make the rest of the church suffer to hear you get up here. I'm the last person to be up here and be speaking. When I walked into the church, I couldn't hold the conversation. When I walked, I was such an introvert, backwards re mess. You see, you don't see that. You laugh now because you never got to see that guy. But I did. And God reached down and grabbed that nothing. Come on. Say, come on. That angry fatherless young man and dropped him into the house of God amongst other people on the journey of the hall of faith other people we spend too much time beating on one another judging one another instead of encouraging one another get on that walk We're, we run from sacrifice and we think oh we give them accolades because they got a little bit of this or a little bit of that no, they may have just given themselves to the wrong side but you keep learning that bass and play it for God. Keep learning to sing and learn to preach and get in them books. Read them books. 
See, a lot of people judge ministry and judge pastor. I'm not getting fed there. Well, you won't go and get out what you put in. And jokers that go church hopping have been shopping before they got here. They ain't going to pan out. If, hey, listen, I'll be honest. If you can't pan out here, you better stay here and hide because you will not pan out anywhere else. I, I make it easy. Now, I'm straight with you. I'm clear with you. I, I'm not to hurt you, but my God, it's more, it's more painful to fall than be told the truth. I'll flat out let you know, listen, if you'll do this, you, you got it. It's right there. But you can't. You, you, it takes, it's obvious what you have to do. If you're not going to say, you can't run at the last minute and read your text out of a, out of a book. You can't chase the things of the world and walk in that you have a great church. You just can't live your best life and think you're going to make it in the Hall of Faith. Because if anybody coming after him has got to deny themselves. That's why people can call me four times in a row because I'm supposed to answer that phone. And they do, the fifth time. But I can go outside, and I can take a shower, and I can go to the bathroom, and I can do other things. But I'm on the job pretty much 24-7. Well, guess what? So should you be. If your neighbor needs something, are you ready? If your friend down the street needs something, if someone comes knocking on your door, will you be willing? Or you look across the room and you see someone in need, are you going to withhold? Heroes habitually show up, and in doing so, they lay down their life to give someone else a chance, someone else a shot. They give somebody else hope. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't how that started? Isn't this how the whole thing started for each and every one of us? Isn't that how it all started? Saying the Son of Man must suffer. Jesus said, now i got to suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. i got to go through this. Here's the bottom line. What was he doing? Heroes set the pace. It's just the standard. Anything less than, well, you're not ready for this. Heroes not only set the pace, they show the path. Jesus said, follow me. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. What's he doing? See, the pace and the path is set. You, you, you're the only person that tries to come up by another way was Satan. Go read about it. They become heroes because they run this race. They become heroes of faith because they show us where to run. Heroes master handoffs. Bible studies, prayer time. Loving, caring, loving my neighbor, spending time. If you're not spending time with the lost, if you're not pouring yourself out, then you're not handing anybody off. You're not handing off a baton. You have no baton to hand off. So your story's over. Oh, heroes work hard to hand off. Matthew 16 and 18, I say also thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What did he do? He handed it off. Get ready, pal. Get ready, pal. The old Peter had to go through some stuff, but he stepped up because, oh, he may have tripped at the starting line, but he got his hand to hold of that thing, and when it came time to preach, he stood up. You see, understand, your life and your travel may not be perfect, but you got to stay. you got to stay in the fight. you got to keep the baton in your hand. So he handed off to Peter. You know, handoffs happen throughout the Bible. 2 Kings 2 and 14, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted him and thither. And Elisha, why? Because he stayed with him. He, took, he received the handoff. Heroes run. But they also take their place in the stands so that others can run. When the handoff comes, you don't just go off and not care. You stand there and you cheer them on. You cheer. Man, every time any of these young people try to do something, their biggest fan's pastor. Anytime someone gets up here to sing, and I, I, see, I saw it the other day when they did that song and they went down the line and each of them sang a verse, I was like, yes. Man, I like to see it. When, when, when one of the young people step up, I want to do this, right? Yes. 
God, if we could get a church looking around and cheering one another, take it on, step up, do it. Come on, you can make it. You're stepping into the hall of faith. You're walking in the footsteps of greatness. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. There's nothing wrong with understanding your place. John the Baptist even said he must increase and I must decrease. Ain't nothing wrong from running your race to understand when it's time to hand that baton off. You see, they don't just set the pace to show the path. They also clear the path. They remove the obstacles that would stop others from running. Oh, Brother Crow, you haven't done much here. I'll tell you what, I've removed some obstacles. I've cut down some grass. I've moved some things out of the way. Oh, man, I, someone said to me the other day, I wonder where you'd be if you started where you are right now 10 years ago. My God. That wasn't my race to run. But I'm going to hand it off and it's going to be somebody else's. Oh, hallelujah. You ought to get excited about that. You ought to get excited about that. I don't know what your time ticker says. But I'll tell you what, I hope you're handing it off. I, I hope you got something going on worthy of handing to somebody. Listen to this, Isaiah 57 and 14. And says, say, cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way. Take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. Every time you come to church, it's not about you just punching a clock, but it's about you making sure, hey, I'm going to pray against this that's resisting the church. I'm going to pray against that. I'm going to fast because I see that issue. I'm going to encourage someone because I want them to be strengthened. I'm going to sing because we need some. I'm going to preach. I, I, what can I do, God? I want to be in the hall of faith. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Hallelujah. We got to make it to where the next person can run faster and further than we did. Even Elijah got to do twice as much as Elijah. Jesus even went as far as to say, he, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than me shall he do. Even Jesus says, Come on, let's go. You can do more. You can do more. You can do better. You see, if we're not careful, we can miss this. The Hebrew writer says that since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, we should, that should cause us to run. That should cause us to step up. I don't know about you, but I was, I, I was raised playing sports. We were a sport fan, playing family. And sadly, my two older sisters being older, they were just better at everything than me. And I don't know how, but my parents always ended up coaching, whether it was little league softball. And then next, next thing you know, I'm in England. I'm playing soccer, and my uncle's one of my coaches. Ain't nothing worse than having one of your family members as a coach. I never could do anything right. But every time I got on the field to play, no matter what it was, I always looked. There's my dad. There's my mom. Oh, God, there's my sisters. <laughs> you know what that would make me do? I'm going to play harder. I'm a, I got spectators in the crowd. I got people watching me. Well, all of heaven is telling you, saint of God. All of heaven was, a Hebrews writer was telling you, all of heaven, every one of those heroes of faith have, have walked their journey, and now they're watching you. They're watching you right now. Right? Those that you read about, the Davids and the Sansons and the Esthers, and that, they're watching you right now. They're seeing what you're doing with your life. They're watching what you're doing with your walk. They're watching what you're doing with your baton. Baton. What are you going to do? I say we still need heroes. We still need people in the hall of faith. We should, that very thought should cause us to run like near. I got someone watching me. Oh, my God, I got Paul watching what I'm doing right now. Paul, what a great man of God, starting churches going all over. My, man, I got him watching me, and I'm too tired to, what? And, and, I, and I'm, I think it's okay late, okay, late to show up a prayer. Wait, I got Paul, and, and I, got, I got this guy, and I got Stephen. They stoned Stephen's watching me, and, and I got a little offended. I got a little butt hurt, and all of a sudden I can't. That ought to make us run a little harder. 
It's a sad day that we want to keep up with the neighbors or be better than them or the Joneses, and we turn around and we realize, oh, heaven, watching our race. So how should we run this race? Lay aside the weight and the sins that entangle us. Following their example, we should run clean, unhindered, so that others can follow our example. It's our turn. It's our turn to hand the baton off. They are in the heavenly stands cheering for us as we run, believing and hoping that we will run in such a way that we too will become someone else's hero. Let's stand. Be thou an example. You see, we are running because of heroes, but we are also running to become somebody else's heroes. If you saw him today, most of you wouldn't pick him out of a crowd unless you remember seeing him. He's fully white-haired now and just a regular-looking dude. Him and his wife pastor a church in South Carolina, but I'm telling you, no matter how you cut it, no matter what he says, if he overeats, undereats, goes swimming or doesn't, he's a hero of mine because almost 40 years ago, he handed me a baton and he said, run this race, Steve. Run this race, Steve. I'll never forget as a new convert, Brother Joe. Didn't hardly know I knew enough scripture to whoop up on a few Mormons and Baptists. Me and my antagonist, we have to understand I had been beat on my whole life. And I'm not looking for sympathy, but the only boy in the house with three sisters and a mom and dad in the military. Well, that's how sisters get away with putting you in a dress. And they get you a dog and they name it Dolly. Look, you know it ain't working good for me when things look like that. So by the time I got here, oh boy, I had a little animosity in me. Some of y'all don't understand now and then, Brother Crow got a little bit of attitude in him. You've been where I've been and seen what I saw. You'd be a little bit like me too. I need a little bit of that to survive what I've been through. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when you handed me this, run, Stevie, run. Heaven still needs heroes. The world still needs people in the hall, walk running to be in the hall of faith. So the question, the question we really must ask, who's running because of us? Who's running this race because of you? Who are you witnessing to? Who, who, who have you handed the baton to? Who have you affected for the kingdom of God? Who have you stepped up? Who will you hand the baton to? Who will you lay down your life for? Who will be here because of you? Who will start on that journey toward heaven because of you? Are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, we need to honor heroes. What you fail to recognize, you will fail to celebrate. And what you fail to celebrate eventually will exit your life. We can't afford to fail to honor our heroes. We don't have to wait until they sit in the stands to honor. We have to. We don't have to wait for eulogies to honor. Mm -hmm. I think as we reflect on our real story, it's appropriate to stop and honor those who have helped us continue in the race. I'm, I'm thankful for my pastors. I'm thankful for the men of God that have reached in and touched my life. I'm even thankful for those who wanted to write me off. Oh yeah, I'm thankful for those that got me mad. I, I'm thankful for the I'm thankful for the guy that I'm still wet from the baptismal looked and said, "Well, we'll see how long you last." I hope you didn't hold your breath. But we have a we have one hero that we have to acknowledge. I'm thankful for my personal heroes. They make my story complete but there's really one more hero the writer of Hebrews concludes his discourse on heroes by drawing attention 
to thy hero. Hebrews 12 and 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Will you let him author? Will you let him author and finish your faith? Oh, we got to get our eyes on Jesus, both to begin and to finish the race we're in. You know, he never lost sight of where he was headed. That amazing finish at Calvary led to the great downpour at Pentecost. So when you find yourself struggling, like you might be right now with this message that the Lord, when you find yourself struggling in your faith, when you start to doubt your purpose in the sacrifice. Won't you just think on that story again? Item by item. That long litany of hostility that Jesus faced, that he plowed through, that he set his face like a flint. Betrayal, abandonment, and denial didn't dissuade him because he had a baton to hand off. He knew that you and I depended on him handing that off. You see, he said in 8 and 20 of Matthew, Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. You see, Jesus wasn't into the physical kingdom here. Isaiah 15, 7, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. You see, confusion comes from trying to serve two masters. Therefore have I set my face, like I'm determined, I got my mind made like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. You see, understand me that understanding that I'm running. Not only for that great cloud of witnesses, but that great comforter that lives within me right now, that walks with me every step of the way. That one, that still small voice that's still speaking to me right now. That ought to shoot some adrenaline into your soul and your spirit. That ought to encourage you. Jesus is the ultimate hero. But I want to please him. His name was Derek Redman. It's one of my favorite stories. Having, I don't look at now at my age, but I used to consider myself an athlete when it comes to track. I could run. I miss that. I miss that. I miss that feeling of freedom. But his name was Derek Redman. Redman. He held the fastest time in the world heading into the semifinals of the 400 meter race at the Olympics. Four years earlier at the 88 Olympics, he had to withdraw because he injured his Achilles heel tendon. He injured it just 90 seconds before his race and had to pull out. All the training, all the sacrifice, all the pain and struggle. And now four years, and five surgeries later, Derek Redman was ready to roll. He's got his feet set in the chalks, hands set down in the red clay. The starting gun went off and Derek took off like a shot. But a hundred meters in, Derek crumpled to the ground and he knew instantly that he had torn his hamstring. Medical and paramedics rushed out to help him. But his frustration with his injury caused him to push them away, waving them aside. He had something else determined in his heart. And he struggled to his feet. No longer able to run, he started hopping and limping and sometimes even crawling. Determined to finish the race. And then, breaking through the crowd was 
an overweight guy wearing a cap that read simply, just do it, running from the stands. And he pushed the security guard aside, ran to Derek's side and embraced him. It was Derek's dad. Derek's dad had been cheering him on for years. You can do it, boy. You can do it, son. And trials growing up and all sorts of races and track meets. And on the ultimate test and field of proving Derek once again injured, his dad wraps his arms around his son's waist and began to help his son limp the rest of the way around the track. Crowd stood to its feet, realizing what was going on, cheering and weeping. Millions of TV viewers around the world realized what was going on as someone just simply wanted to finish their race. Finally, Derek, in the arms of his dad, crossed the finish line together arm in arm long after the other runners had finished the race. It's not always how you start, but it is that you finish.